Um, and hopefully I can at least offer some insight, but I, I can never fix anything for anyone. That's up to everybody individually. Um, but I want everyone to know it's extremely difficult to play trumpet, and it's extremely rewarding, and uh, even the very best players have the same problems we do. You know, if you think you have the worst problem in the world, believe me, I have that problem. I know hundreds of guys who are great players, way better than me, have the exact same problem at one point or another, or their whole lives. Uh, some of the most famous trumpet players suffered from severe pressure problems. Louis Armstrong is one of the most famous. Um, I can name dozens of famous trumpet players who suffered from severe pressure problems. And what I mean by pressure is applying too much pressure with a hard piece of metal against your lip, which is then uh, backed up by bone or your teeth, or in a lot of cases, a bridge and fake teeth because they pushed them out from pushing too hard. Um, that is a very common occurrence, especially with trumpet players. You don't really see it much in French horn, almost never in low brasses. It's a trumpet problem. Um, and that's because playing trumpet is kind of like an athletic event. And we try to push ourselves maybe harder than we should, a lot of times with equipment that can't really get us where we want to be. Um, and 99% of it is because we're trying to do something the wrong way, you know? So, um, Getting to the little piece in my mouthpiece, um, which someone noticed today, up here are four of my mouthpieces. I only play on two of these regularly, and I'll play on them for you here in a few minutes. Um, but uh, there are two that are much shallower, and uh, I really have a reason to play shallow, because I can play high on a big mouthpiece, so there's no reason to have a shallow one. Um, but I do have them so you can hear the difference. Uh, the question earlier was, why do I have a little, or what is the little thing that's in one of my mouthpieces? And um, I'm sure no one else even noticed it. But in the cup of one of my mouthpieces is a piece of clay. And it fills in part of the mouthpiece. And that little piece of clay was something I invented to train myself to be a more consistent player in all registers, to play high and low with good endurance. I had this theory years ago that the way the embouchure works is different than the way the mouthpiece is designed. Or in other words, we have a round mouthpiece, but our lips and our armature are not round. And because it's not, we're using the wrong tool for the job. And I still to this day truly believe that this is a serious problem that prevents most trumpet players from doing what they want to do. If you've ever been a lead player on a big band gig or a small combo gig, and then you played with Kenny Holman, and the guy played an octave higher than you, even though you can play really high, and he was three times louder, then you stop and think to yourself, how? He plays saxophone, like how is that even possible? The guy just shredded me. And the reason is because the saxophone and the mouthpiece really um, underwent a long development that was designed to make it more ergonomic for your mouth to make that possible. It wasn't always possible. Saxophone mouthpieces used to be round too. And then eventually they changed them and they developed them. And today you could spend $2,000 on a really high-end custom saxophone mouthpiece. Whereas most of you didn't spend $2,000 on your trumpet. So um, the round mouthpiece on a trumpet is probably the single most uh, important and detrimental factor that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, everyone offers round mouthpieces, even me. Our new mouthpiece line will be round. But down the road next year, we'll start to offer the other ones that I've experimented with. Um, the reason a mouthpiece is round, anyone can guess here? Why? Easy to make. Yeah, how do they make them? On a lathe. They make them on a lathe. Does everyone know what a lathe is? <coughs> or a lathe? It's technically what they call it. Um, a lathe is basically a, a spindle or a rotating axis and you can put a chuck in it and you can put some metal in it and it spins or in other words it spins this way okay and because it does then you can take a tool and remove metal as it's spinning but whatever you make is always round you can't make anything not round on a lathe and when they started making mouthpieces almost 200 years ago they made them out of wood the first ones were not made on a lathe they were kind of carved out then they had this amazing new tool the lathe and it's the same one we use today, the same basic concept. Um, almost all manufacturers still use a two-axis lathe that can only cut rounds. We have a six-axis lathe, so now we're going to start cutting other shapes 
Uh, my friend Dave Harrison is uh, the inventor of the wedge mouthpiece. If anyone's seen that? Yeah, uh, Dave is a good guy. He plays on a couple of my horns. And um, he has a wedge mouthpiece where he's removed some of the material on each side. Uh, one day he called me up and said, Jason, I have this idea. Can you try this mouthpiece? And tell me what you think of it. I played it and I said, well, Dave, honestly, it's nice. It didn't do anything for me, but I gave it to some of my students and it seemed to help with different things and play better. It has material removed on both sides so that um, basically it's not a round mouthpiece, but it's based on a round mouthpiece. And uh, to make a long story short, Dave has a great following of clients who want to buy these mouthpieces that are different. Um, I hope that in the future he and I both and individually will be developing different versions that uh, are not round because since your mouth isn't round, I don't know why we're using it. Um, but um, how our body and our mouth works with a round mouthpiece is what I'm going to describe because that's what we have to deal with today. And I'll also describe why that little piece is in my mouthpiece. Um, and I'll do this without any illustrations, so it might be a little bit tricky. You may want to ask questions here if you get lost. Your upper lip is kind of a straight line across uh, your embouchure. It doesn't really have the flexibility or the coordination to become other shapes. Or in other words, your upper lip is kind of like my hand. It's just a flat piece. These are both sides of my lips. Your lower lip can do other things. Your lower lip can change all kinds of shapes. We can do this, right? And it's not easy to do that kind of thing when you're playing an instrument. But when you're using a proper armature, your upper lip isn't moving like that. But your bottom lip is. So your bottom lip can kind of be like this. Everyone see that? And I can make my bottom lip more flat or more cupped like this, and I can change it. Because I can do that, then I can let more or less air out, and I can also make the bottom lip or the upper lip different lengths. Now this is kind of out there stuff that most people never ever hear of or talk about. But your aperture and your lips that create the buzz actually are controlled, uh, or actually control the pitch by air pressure, by air speed, by tension, and by length. And the length part is the part that's always missing for most people. You'll hear all different versions of, of embouchures and how they work. Um, the thing is, they always have one or two components, but they don't have all of them. Uh, very rarely. So, tension, we, we'll leave that out for now, but basically tension would be like the equivalent of taking a violin string and tightening it or loosening it. When you do that, you didn't make the string any longer or shorter, but it raised the pitch when you tightened it. Same thing happens on the trumpet. So that's tension, that's all I'm going to say. Length, if you were to play the violin, and you're going to play uh, an A, right, just an open string, it's got a fixed length. How do you play an octave higher? Anyone? Any string players? Touch it in the middle. You touch it in the middle because you're going to cut the string in half. And when you cut it in half, it plays an octave higher. That's another physics principle, simple. If you want to play an octave higher than that, you, you take the original string and you cut it in a fourth or a half of a half. Okay, and that's another one. And it's exponential. Um, so, the lips or your armature does the exact same thing. Your lower lip, in a basic nutshell, will play the low notes or it'll resonate for the low notes because it has more length. See, it's, let's see this again. This is cupped like this. This is my lower lip. If you measure this distance, this length, it's way longer than the parts it's touching up here. So because it is, it can play the low notes. The upper notes are controlled by the length of the top lip. So the smaller you make this, and I'll just use these fingers for now, the smaller you make your, the little valley in your lips, let's see if I can do this, maybe like that, then everything kind of moves like this and becomes a smaller hole, but that's all controlled with your bottom lip. And I really should have made an illustration, but if you want to see it, I can draw it out for you. Your bottom lip is what, what controls the length of the upper lip. And if you walk away with anything today of what I've said, and if you want to hear it again, let me know, it's super important to know that your bottom lip is what controls the upper register. If you want to play double or triple high C, you have to work on your bottom lip. Uh, it's so important because it's going to control the length of your upper lip. 
because the upper lip is the one that's resonating. Or in other words, your bottom lip is the fingers on the violin, and the string is your upper lip, if that makes any sense. All right. Those are the basic principles. The reason I have that stuff in my mouthpiece is because when you play around mouthpiece, your bottom lip tends to fall into the cup because it's so big. When it does, if this were my bottom lip, and let's say if we're trying to, I'm, I'm just gonna pretend like um, this is the ends of my bottom lip. They exert pressure on the upper lip. If my lip falls in there, then it can't stop the upper lip on either end so that it's a shorter vibrating surface. So how do you play high then? Most people add pressure. They squeeze really hard. When you add pressure, you're just squashing the lip. That's tension again. You're squashing it so hard that you either create a smaller opening, because it gets squashed against your teeth, or you create more lip tension and it goes higher. So a lot of people play high, really loud, and really well, but they have a really bad ring afterwards, are playing with some form of pressure and less coordination. 